I think we can go ahead and get started. Welcome to the show. It is the Scene Stones Podcast Live. It's Tuesday night at 9.30, 9.36, and I am here. I'm running a little bit behind because I had to wait for, well, I had to wait for anybody. He had to wait for me, <laughs> um, for my very special co-host uh, this week. He's, he's a guest co-host. Uh, hopefully, we can finagle him on for more. Um, Mr. Joe Loud. How you doing, buddy? How you doing? Doing all right. <laughs> I'm so glad you could join me. And Joe and I go back a long way. We went to college together. We lived in LA together. Uh, we've been, he's one of my best friends in the world. Um, and I'm so thankful I can have him on the show. He is a VFX artist in the industry. Uh, unlike me, he stayed in uh, and he got things done. Um, yeah, so I'm so excited to have you on the show. I want to talk to, to, talk to you about a bunch of stuff and see how you're, how you're doing, how it's going. Um, but thank you everybody for joining. Remember, we're here every Tuesday night at 9.30. It's the Scene Stops Podcast Live. I want you guys involved. We're going to have some topics coming up. One of the big ones, I want to hear from you guys. Movies that you really, truly can't wait to see on the big screen. Seems like everything's coming back right now. And you know, our main topic tonight is going to be Jurassic Park being number one again. So we'll get to that. But I want to hear what you guys have to say. So sound off and I'll, read, I'll be reading your comments through uh, as we're speaking. But Joe, I want to talk to you a little bit about visual effects. Um, an industry, a job in the industry that I don't think gets as much credit as it deserves. Would you say that's the case? Yes, it's very thankless work. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. And I, I, the reason I know that is because I, I, living with you, even, you know, in college and how much you did uh, from your first rotoscope job, which I was there watching you do it. Mm -hmm. um, and then living together in Los Angeles and working the beat um, in different gigs. And you were always working. You were mm -hmm. always meticulously putting together some amazing stuff. So mm -hmm. um, I, I, I don't think at that time I appreciated visual effects, a visual effects artist as much as I should have until uh, mm -hmm. you showed me the way. Uh, so more and more I find myself getting mad every time I see visual effects artists kind of being put down mm -hmm. you know not put down but held down held back if you will mm -hmm. um but i i gotta to ask you um some of your some of your work uh, i'll let you talk about it i want to hear some of the things you've worked on and you know we'll let everybody know but um what is it that you what is it that you do in the visual effects field well typically like i'm generally well, my title would be a compositor is what I generally do. And what a compositor is, is they're the person who like, when they shoot the movie, they go out and they go out on, on their location or whatever. And they have the big, you know, the big cardboard cutout of the dinosaur that's there. Then, and they film that whole scene. And then a CG artist will build the dinosaur and some, somebody will track it and they'll do all the other processes. I'm the guy who puts it all together at the end and I put all the finishing touches on it and make it look like that dinosaur is really standing in that forest or whatever. Um, so I, I'm, I'm the guy who puts it all together at the end and it's, it's, it's kind of a fun job. It's like building Legos. <laughs> it, re it really is. And I think, like I said, my appreciation has always grown with you, but, uh, and, and seeing what you do. But none more so than when I visited you at work. What was this in 2013? Yeah, something um, like that. I, you know, I, was oh, I, I think. Well, I think it was a little later because Sarah had been born. It was maybe 2014. Oh, 2014. Yes, I'm sorry. 2014, 2015. Yeah. Um, and I, I came back out to LA to visit you guys, and oh man, you brought me into your job, and you showed mm -hmm. me something you were working on, which was a scene from uh, I think it was NCIS. And I, I, I don't remember which, what, what, what was happening in, in, in it was, shot. it was two of the stars walking away on an aircraft carrier. Uh, from Oh Colorado. yeah. And yeah. when I tell you guys that there was nothing there except for the two actors, like he showed me the scene finished and there was an ocean, they're in an aircraft carrier, the helicopter just landed, the propellers are going, people are running around, uh, all in the background and stuff like that. And they're talking. The two actors are talking, and I'm watching the scene. I'm like, "Oh yeah, that's cool." And he just starts taking layers away. 
<laughs> and to soon find out that it was literally just the two actors <laughs> walking towards, mm -hmm. you know, out of frame. And I'm like, you built literally the ocean. <laughs> you built an aircraft carrier. You built the helicopter. Nothing existed. I at least thought they maybe shoot on an aircraft carrier that's mm -hmm. knocked or something, you know, and you put the water behind it. You had and I think they do sometimes. I think they, they, I, I'm not sure how that works. I haven't worked on NCIS in a long time. So. But it was, it was such a, it was so crazy to see and just to realize what's there and what's not there and how much detail goes in because you had birds in there, you had cloud shapes and you, I remember talking about, you were studying the clouds that would be like on a day, like you, you were like looking for clouds that would have been on that type of day, like or something. I forget how you did it. You're yeah. missing Neil deGrasse Tyson. Over I, yeah, I'm. I, I'm always. always a, I'm always a little nerd for for the details like that. You know. I, I was just, and you, and you told me you had built everything, like even the helicopter and stuff, from like nothing. Like you, it was your details. So. Well, not not that I built it. Some somebody else would have built the helicopter, or maybe we we maybe bought the model. Um, mm. but yeah, like, a, like that, that's the, the guy who makes the dinosaur. That's a different guy. I'm the guy who puts the dinosaur in the picture. Now um, you work, you've worked on a lot of stuff. Um, uh, like you worked on men in black three, correct? I'm going to wrap uh, up some I'm trying to remember. Well, yes, men in black three. Um, there were, there was a, I worked at prime focus as a 3d conversion artist for a while and that that's its own can of worms and so probably some of my most well-known credits are or they're working as a 3d conversion artist that's and uh one of the big ones that we were geeking out over i remember we were talking back and forth was star wars you worked on the mm -hmm. star wars movies yeah uh, as a 3d conversion and 3d conversion fortunately they never came out but you, the you're, first one did the first one did and your name was in the credits added that right yep they added, name they added our names to the credits. It's forever solidified <laughs> in the Star Wars credits. Which and actually, they have, I, have, uh, I don't have, well. You have Star Wars behind you. Do that. Yeah, there's that. But, uh, there's, uh, right here, Cinefx. This is, this nice. is, is like a, like a VFX. Uh, um, it's, like, it's like a trade magazine for the visual effects industry. Right here on the last page. Very nice. Because there were a lot of people who actually didn't make it in. Um, so they took out this whole page ad in the, in the magazine. And where am I? <laughs> uh, right there. Probably won't be able to see it. <laughs> what, your most, triumphant, your most triumphant iPad won't let me see it? Yeah. <laughs> Dude, but, I got uh, yeah, it was cool. They gave us all copies of it too. I, I rem all I remember, <laughs> I just, my my nights of like, you know, doing nothing, trying to write the Great American Script or or putting together some type of ske um, schedule or budget or something, was just mm -hmm. kind of like sitting in front of the TV eating Cheetos. <laughs> you were just like. Like I said, meticulously sitting and working and, and doing your thing, and then like you'd come up with this brilliant thing. So it was always a lot of fun to see what you were going to come up with next. Um, so <laughs> I'm so glad to have you on the show. I'm glad we talked about this, um, but I do want to kind of touch on some things. I know you're not a big wrestling fan. But yeah, I don't really follow it. My my brothers, they were more into it, so I picked up little things here and there over the years. Well, I. I used to do a show on the Scene Snobs channel uh, called mm -hmm. 20 Minute Wrestling Podcast. And I, uh, okay. I have since gotten out of it. And one thing I kind of want to talk about that really annoyed me tonight, and uh, you know, you can please add to it as much as you want, but it's more of a rant on my end that I felt needed mm -hmm. to come out. Is even though I stopped doing the wrestling podcast because I, I'm kind of like boycotting WWE and it's a whole thing, um, there's this big movement right now of speak out and now people I've talked to and worked with on the 20 minute wrestling podcast are I'm hearing them gab now about the speak out movement, which is women in wrestling coming out, talking about being victims of rape, sexual mm -hmm. assault, sexual misconduct, the whole nine. And I'm getting annoyed because there's a lot of people out there and excuse me for this, but I need to bring it up. 
Uh, so if they watch this, they understand how mad I am. Anybody who says or acts like, oh my God, I can't believe this has happened is a complete and utter lying piece of crap. Um, everybody knows for years that it's been like this in the wrestling industry since be the beginning of the wrestling industry. Women have been mistreated horribly uh, sexually um, and, uh, and, and you know, physically beaten, abused, things like that for years and years. There's been stories coming out. So I just wanted to bring that up. I wanted to put forth, and I'm sorry, Joe, I know on your guest, <laughs> as you as a guest co-host, uh, I'm kind of bringing it down, but I did need, I felt I needed to say that because more and more people are coming to speak out and more and more people I've worked with are, are reporting news and they're acting flabbergasted by the whole thing. And I'm just like, this is bullshit. You've known about it and you haven't said about it, anything about it in years. Um, so I wanted to call them out on that. So that was me speaking out a little bit, but let's get to a little bit more lighter fare. Uh -huh. Yeah. And talk some geek news. You up for that? Sure. Well, one thing I wanted to talk to you about, and I specifically you, is that we may be getting our Batman back. Mm. Michael Keaton is in talks, in heavy talks, to come and be in the Flashpoint movie and reprise his role as Batman. Wow. Uh, now, that's a, that's a big deal. I mean, mm. we're getting Michael Keaton back as Batman, and the heavy rumors are that he would be, he'd kind of replace Ben Affleck. Um, they would rework it so he is kind of the main hub Batman in the DC mm -hmm. movies. So okay. uh, they're going to introduce the multiverse and stuff like that. Now, I know you're not a comic book guy. Uh, not, not much, like you are, but, um, but I do know. I, I feel like I, I, I missed the boat and I'm so like, just trying to get into it it's like there's it's like trying to watch the simpsons from the beginning it'll take you like years <laughs> well i do have to say you at least know who batman is you've at least yeah. seen the batman movies mm -hmm. um how do you feel about michael keaton coming back man do you think that would be awesome i think i think it would be, would be cool i i mean i don't i don't know like with the DC movies, you have the the original Superman and and then Nolan's Batman movies. Or those those are the ones that I remember the best. And the the Tim Burton Batman movies, I think I saw them back around when they were new, and I don't remember them as as well as I should. I should watch them again. Yeah. <laughs> but it would be really cool to see him. He, he was a he was a he was a good Batman. You know, he had he had his own take on on Bruce Wayne you know he was interesting too because I remember people didn't like the fact that he was going to be it was kind of like the Heath Ledger thing when he became Joker and he was announced people didn't like that Michael Keaton the comedian was going to be Batman mm -hmm. they thought it would be a joke uh, and now everybody's like buying like get him back as Batman um, actually Chris Sales one of the one of uh, my guys who watches the show thank you Chris for this supposedly on the Spider-Man movie that Michael Keaton was working on, hopefully, yeah. he would keep walking past Tom Holland and whispering in his ear, I'm Batman. I'm Batman. Yeah. Now, <laughs> let's take that. that in for a second. 16-year-old, 17-year-old kid who's playing Spider-Man in probably the biggest Spider-Man movies ever has Batman walking up to him and telling him, I'm Batman. Like, that's <laughs> got to bring you down, man. <laughs> uh, I am excited, though. I think it opens up I have not been excited for a DC movie and I don't know how long. They've yeah. been annoying. They keep changing things around. They're not getting anything right. Um, yeah. You know, doing, that, doing too much. Yeah, I, I, I don't know, like, what... I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> like, yeah. why they keep making these side things. Like, you know, The Joker was a good film, but it, it's like... What are you doing? Is, is this supposed to be tied into? I don't think it is. If it is, it's. Um, I've had some talks with other friends about about the Joker. Anyway, anyway I don't want to harp on it, but yeah, it's it's kind of a mess. It's like, like with the, the Birds of Prey, Suicide Squad stuff, and like they just don't. I, DC doesn't. Which I've talked about this before because I talked about this with uh, Universal and their Dark Universe. Uh, 
thing they had going on. And then uh, I talked about this with the um, DC. They all own the rights to their characters. Like Marvel was kind of, you know, had to make a deal with Sony, had to buy Fox for most of their characters, you know, just to get these um, mega characters from uh, comic book lore into their movies. Cause it, it didn't like, there's certain things that don't work without Spider-Man. There's certain things that don't work without uh, the X-Men eventually coming up and things like that. So, you know, I, Marvel worked so hard. They put together a plan. They built it out and it worked. They took the years to figure it out after, mm -hmm. after hits and misses. So, I mean, they could have done this earlier, but I really think they just stopped and said, let's do this. And then you have everybody else playing catch up. And rather than, okay, we're going to sit down, we're going to plan in three years time, we're going to have our first movie come out. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're going to connect it to Man of Steel or something or whatever. They were just like, what does everybody want? Oh, we want Doomsday versus Superman. Okay, let's do that. Let's put Batman in there. Let's put Wonder Woman in there. <laughs> you know, I, I, the, like anybody, like I said, anybody who knows me and knows, like, I was more of a DC kid growing up. So for me, not going to see Justice League in the theaters is a big deal. Yeah. You know, that's like, I know a lot of people are probably like, yeah, 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 whatever. I'm like, no, that's a big deal. If I didn't go see Avengers and you were comparing you know, my childhood self to me or whatever, or Iron Man or whatever, you'd be like, okay, that's fine. He didn't really read Iron Man. He didn't, you know, I kind of read Avengers, but not really. It really only when it tied in with bigger stuff. Um, like Spider-Man was another big one. Like you got to go see the Spider-Man movies. So for me to not go see a Justice League movie with everybody in it, that that tells you something. Um, and I'm not saying I'm special. I'm just saying I know I'm one of many who probably did the same thing because that movie did horrible. Um, now, to get past that, I am back in if they get Michael Keaton on board. If they bring Michael Keaton on board, I am back in because he is going to be Batman Bruce Wayne from 89 like it's going to be him just older so they they are doing it right in my opinion on that um and so do you think they're are they are they gonna do like the the what is it batman beyond where it was like a younger batman uh, like the older bruce wayne was like training a new batman or that's a good question. I don't know. That would be awesome if they did. Everybody for a while has wanted that. Everybody for a while has wanted yeah. him in the Batman Beyond setting, training Terry McGill McGinnis um, uh, to become the new Batman. But if they can do this where if Flash meets up with him and goes into his universe, brings him back, and then he pulls together the Justice League or whatever, I'm in, man. I'm in. They can do whatever book they want to do. Hopefully Kingdom Cup, which is one of the best. I know you were talking to me about certain books to read. That's definitely one you should. Um, but right now, that's it's so amazing to me that this is uh, sorry. So it's so amazing to me that they're bringing this back out. I, I, I'm in love with it. Uh, I, I can't wait for this to happen. Um, now, we were talking about, remember everybody, uh, the topics tonight, which I don't think anybody's watching anyway, so that's okay. Uh, <laughs> topics tonight are what movies do you want to see on the big screen? So let us know what you guys think. All right. So to switch gears a little bit, I want to talk to you um, about Jurassic Park. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about it this morning a bit, and you were the one that first let me know that Jurassic Park was number one at the box office for the first time in 27 years. Correct. Yeah, it's it's like Jurassic Park and Jaws are like up near the top. Yep, Jurassic Park is number one, eighty one hundred eighty seven screens, and it made five hundred and sixteen thousand dollars, <laughs> um, and became number one at the box office. And I got to say, I went to the. It's all drive-ins right now that are doing that. Uh, I don't know if you have any drive-ins near you in New Mexico. I should, I've been meaning to look it up. I haven't yet. If you have you ever been to a drive-in theater? I've actually never been to a drive-in. No. Oh my god! Let me tell you, it is an experience onto itself. Like you gotta go to a drive-in. 
Um, it would, you would especially, I think, would really dig it. You love that Americana type stuff, um, and I, I, it, that's kind of what it is, you know. Dirt parking spots, just you know, you got the old microphones. Um, I'm gonna look it up now while I have you. Drive-in theaters, New Mexico. And I am going to see. You have one. You have one in Fort Union Drive-In Movie Theater. Where is it? In Fort Union? <laughs> oh. Uh, I don't know exactly. Uh, oh, it's in Las Vegas. <laughs> well, it's like a three-hour drive. I don't know that it's worth it for a three-hour drive. <laughs> Um, because you still got to sit in your car for a while. So, um, but they are doing them at uh, Isleta Amphitheater, which is a uh, outdoor, uh, outdoor uh, concert venue here. That's nice. on the southern side of town. So maybe they, maybe they'll have some of those. Oh, they're doing Jumanji: A Dog's Journey. It looks like family friendly stuff. They are. Um, next week, I know the drive in here because we have one that's about ten minutes away from my house. Um. One, my biggest reason for moving here. <laughs> no, uh, mm -hmm. but that last week we saw Grease and Footloose mm -hmm. um, at the at the drive-in. I got to tell you, watching the drive-in scene of Grease at the drive-in was <laughs> was pretty meta. Um, <laughs> but they have so it's it was Grease and Footloose we went to see, but behind us they were showing Sonic the Hedgehog and Ferris Bueller's Day Off. <laughs> so that was awesome. Next week, next week we're going. Uh, well, this Thursday we're going for Jaws and Jurassic Park. Have okay. to go see Jaws and Jurassic Park. Um, next week we are going, and they're showing on one screen. They're showing Count Dracula versus Frankenstein and uh, Brain of Blood, <laughs> which were two horror movies back in the '60s that were pretty. They were more tame than anything. So I'm going to take uh, my stepson to go see them. Nice. Um, and then behind us on the screen behind us, they're going to be playing Ghostbusters and Jumanji to the next level. Nice. So yeah, I mean, drive-ins are killing it right now. And I, and I, you know, some things that are coming up, like I, I went to the drive-in maybe about five or six times last summer. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and I went to the movie theaters a lot because I do psycho cinema, um, you know, behind me like uh it's a club out in the alamo draft house around here so we do that but so i went to that theater a lot but now with everything going on my concerns you know are a little weary about being in theaters at the moment you know are going back to theaters at the moment so i'm excited to get in and go to the driving because you just chill in the chill in your car and watch good movies they're showing evil dead that's coming back they're going to be showing um uh, Empire Strikes Back. Nice. That's coming back. You know, so many things are coming back that just are, are, are revving me up to want to go see um, what's going on. So uh, it's just been exciting times. I mean, I, I know you said you have, you've never been to a drive-in before, but like even if like theaters were open, this would be exciting. Um, I don't know that I need anything new. Just keep showing me the old stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, That's what I'm doing. <laughs> So how do you feel about like a movie as you, you brought up a good point this morning that there are two movies that are doing the best in, you know, in the country right now are movies that are socially relevant to everything. Kind of relevant. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I love that uh, when you said that. So um, what do you think about like, like, you know, just a duo like that coming back out and becoming number one after 27 years? I think it's great. I, I think it's awesome that, that uh, you know, younger people are getting to see these movies. You know, like, when we were in L.A., there was there was a pretty good selection of being able to go catch a, a classic movie being played in a theater somewhere. Like, we went to see, it was one of the, most, the best experiences ever, was going and seeing Back to the Future trilogy yep. at the Egyptian theater. Um, you and I went. <laughs> and um, I saw, uh, I saw the black hole literally sitting next to Robert Forster. <laughs> um, but you know, it's it's harder to come by in smaller smaller areas. So now it seems that since 
they're that's what that's what's available and people are getting to see these classics but they maybe would have gotten the opportunity to see them on a big screen well i i love that too and i love your story i want to hear your story about sitting next to robert forrester watching it i have heard <laughs> but we are on a podcast so i want other people uh, to as well uh, especially because black hole is something you love so much <laughs> as a movie you you've always been about so what did you uh what was that like sitting next to you know rest in peace um Forrester? it was well i mean the thing was it was we sat down we we're just sitting there waiting for the movie to start and and mel is is uh to my left and she's like she's like hey i think i know that that actor over there i think it's an actor over there and i'm like i'm like if that's who i think it is he's in this movie <laughs> and and it turns out that he wasn't even there like as a guest he wasn't invited or anything he just wanted to take his, his grandkid to see this movie that he was in when he was younger in the seventies. And so he just, he just happened to go to the movie and we happened, I happened to, Mel and I happened to be sitting right next to him. And uh, on the way out, cause people started noticing on the, on the way out. <laughs> and so like me and a handful of other people, we just, we tried to politely, you know, shake his hand or something. I got a picture with him over the marquee uh, outside the, the theater. A really nice guy. And I actually got an opportunity to meet him one more time um, before he died. Um, was the rap party for El Camino. Because mm -hmm. um, Mel worked on that. And uh, um, so I got to meet him again and I told him, <laughs> I told him about that. And it was, it was, oh, he's a super nice guy. He just started talking about, uh, you know, what it was like to work on the black hole and, and how it was sort of, it was sort of a, I'm, I'm trying to remember his story right now. I'd have to think about it. Um, but he, he, he had said, uh, it was one of those kind of things where it was just a paycheck, you know, yeah. like it was, it was like every day that you, you, come in and they haven't fired you it was a good day or something like that <laughs> you know because it was it was what it was disney was kind of taking a risk trying to com uh, compete with star wars you know make their star wars movie um and so it was it was a bit of a risk and, I, and they they hadn't written an ending that's why the end the movie ends the way it does um really they, yeah like they were kind of very unsure about how they were going to end it and so they just kind of tacked on that heaven and hell thing at the end. Um, and uh, yeah, so, but he was just saying like, every, every day I didn't get fired was a good day. <laughs> you know, it's funny. It, yeah, it's, I always got the black hole and um, what was it, the final countdown with uh, Kirk Douglas mixed up where they go back in time to Pearl, uh, Pearl Harbor? Yes. As a kid, I, I don't get it mixed up now. As a kid, I got yeah. it. Because they would show them both on TV a lot, uh -huh. and I and then it both kind of felt like I don't know why it just felt like very military at times. So mm -hmm. I, I just I always got them mixed up. But um, that was so when I <laughs> all right. So I'm kind of getting off topic of what you're talking about, uh, and I want to go oh, right. back <laughs> to it. But I just found out recently. I didn't realize that the final countdown with Kirk Douglas was produced. By Lloyd Kaufman, which has Troma Video or Troma Entertainment. Oh, okay. So, um, that I don't know why I felt that. All right, you know my brain, so I don't have to explain it to you. But my brain is just kind of like, yeah, that's where I went. <laughs> as he's explaining, <laughs> as he's explaining the story about the black hole, that's where my brain went. Um, yeah. But I want to go back to what we were saying. We did my first time seeing Back to the Future on the big screen was with you when we went to that triple fe feature. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, that, I, I, I know you said you've seen it several times yeah. now. Yeah, I haven't gotten to see it again since then, but... Uh, you have not watched Back to the Future since we went there? No, on the... Oh, big on theaters. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, oh, I've seen it. I've seen it, you know, it's like a monthly at least. <laughs> yeah. As a, and I, I showed it to Sarah, my daughter, and she loves she loves it. She quotes it, and it's really silly the the, the things that 
that she repeats, you know, like from, from E.T. and from Back to the Future. And... Um, I, before we go on, I just saw a comment that popped uh, up that pertains to both of us and the person commenting on it. So I feel like I should, I should bring it up. Uh, let me read the comments real quick. Uh, Len Francis says, New Jersey has been erecting drive-in theaters via farms or parks. It's been doing well. Our town has been showing kid-friendly movies. Well, New Jersey is where the drive-in was born, where movies were born. Um, Andrew says, hey, Joe. Rob says, it's awesome that the classics are coming back. I agree. I'm hoping it's something that doesn't change when things settle down. I agree, Rob. Never seen the black hole. Uh, you should. It's a good movie. Um, uh, Len Francis says, same, Rob. I always pass the cover at the Hollywood video and I've he heard of it, but I guess it was, uh, I need to add it to my list now. But you should. Black Hole is a good movie. Keep saying that. Uh, and then Rob says, it was on sale for 99 cents on VHS at Suncoast Video. Both places I've worked. They both name places that I worked. Uh, I bought it for Christmas for all my friends. Didn't pick myself up a copy. Oh. <laughs> um, and then Andrew says, I'll read Rob's first. Violet really liked Back to the Future too. Some of it went over her head though. That's fair, and it will. Um, just like the blowjob scene in Ghostbusters. That uh, that I had no idea that existed until I was an adult. Um, I knew it existed. I didn't know what it was. I was just, oh, he's dreaming. Um, <laughs> and there's a ghost there. Andrew says, and I'm reluctant to say this comment, uh, but Andrew says. Ask Joe about second grade to love and the experience he had working on that. <laughs> uh, for anybody who doesn't know, a very long time ago, there were three bros and they did a show. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> they did a little movie called Second Grade to Love. Uh, I happened to be one of the bros in that show. Um, I wrote that piece of crap. <laughs> it is a terrible movie that nobody will ever find. Uh, I've hidden it. Uh, Joe, his wife, and Andrew, who asked the question, have all worked on that movie. Uh, I, I quickly want to move on to the Joel Schumacher movies uh, because the man passed away, but I will allow you to answer this question. <laughs> well, I mean, what is there to say? It was a, it was a student <laughs> film that we, we made. It was like... You wasn't this where you had shifted to the to the class behind us already at this point? <laughs> you mean got yeah. kicked out for a month? <laughs> I wasn't going to put it that way. <laughs> I was the first person in full sale history to be kicked out after two weeks, <laughs> and then come back and speak at graduation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, it's uh, um, you know, it's. If you've worked on a on a, uh, uh, a small budget, like little production, it wasn't much different than that. It's just a bunch of friends hanging out, yeah. you know, trying to work together to make something. So it's fun, you know, being around everybody. <laughs> the the way it turned out, it, <laughs> it's like, you know, but you, you gotta you gotta learn to crawl before you learn to walk and oh uh, man yeah and and i got to know my wife on that yes show yes you did um i often take credit for introducing you to your wife even though i know i didn't well but technically I, I had met her already but and and we worked on but like the last day of the shoot for that weekend i believe yeah. there was a there was a um basketball game um Mavericks and Heat I think mm -hmm. and uh Alex was rooting for the Heat Mel was rooting for the Mavericks you know it's the NBA final and we all went to the three of us went to a bar to watch the game game was over Alex left and Mel and I stayed and hung out and talked for a while and the rest is history so <laughs> well, I so anybody who doesn't know um Joe's wife works in the industry as well. She's, man, she's a powerhouse in the industry uh, in a lot of ways. Like, done, um, She's worked on some fantastic productions as well. Um, and, uh, and, you know, she's working, she's in the Director's Guild, working her way to becoming, I, I've always said that Mel is going to be 
one of the best producers in the industry one day. Mm -hmm. Um, and I still stand by that and I believe that. Um, but she's working her way towards, um, first assistant director, which I mean, she knows that job inside and out. I, of course, you know, she worked her first time as a first assistant director on a little movie called Second Grade to Love. Um, <laughs> you're welcome, Mel. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I remember I didn't hire Alex did. Oh. I was, I had written the movie. I was producing the movie. It was my money going into the movie uh, that nobody will ever see ever. Um, <laughs> and I remember I came on set and I was standing off to the side having a cigarette. You secretly watch it. You secretly pull it out and watch it. Don't no, I, I don't even know what it is. Watch it <laughs> I do have a copy. And I have a digital copy, too. Uh -huh. I do have a digital copy because I worked on a podcast a few years ago. And uh, in that podcast, uh, they found it. And then I subsequently got made sure it got taken <laughs> off of everywhere and I saved one copy just for nostalgia's sake, um, which I should burn. I should just burn the internet. <laughs> you know, the, now that I think about it, the editor, um, he lives here in Albuquerque as well. I haven't, yeah, I haven't, I haven't hung out. He might still have a copy. <laughs> I know. Um, I, I, after all these years, I highly doubt it. It was just a really bad movie. I admit that it was one of the worst written movies anybody could ever do, and I wrote it, and I'm saying that. And then there is an, there is an even more, oh man, pretentious behind the scenes video that's longer than the movie. That's how pretentious we were. We made a behind the scenes video inter where we were being interviewed. We directed our own interviews. We got somebody to come in and be the interviewer, but we directed our own interviews. How pretentious were we? And it was 30 minutes long, whereas the movie's like 16 or 17 minutes. It was is, so, is the movie even that long? I don't, I don't know. I love her. Um, <laughs> um, it, it's just, it's, oh, I can't believe this is what we're talking about. Thank you, Anne. Um <laughs> So... <laughs> this is such a stupid movie and we're still talking about it so what's going on here so we uh it will never be shown in a drive-in so nobody asked um we <laughs> I was, so i was sitting there as my first it was the first day i got to the set a little late because i had to pick up some stuff i'm sitting off to the side on the location having a cigarette um and mel yelled at me mel was like you can't be smoking and just standing here we're filming <laughs> Just like, I'm the producer. I said, I'm funding this. And she didn't care. And she ran a tight ship. And from that day forward, we just, you yeah, know, you just listen to Mel. Uh, I knew she was going to be really good at this job because she, uh, she yelled at me right off the bat and did not care. I was, I got mad and I was just like, what? I can't fire her. She's great at this. <laughs> She's doing exactly what I want her to do. Um, and that's why I know she's a tour de force, uh, working in that. Um, so I, I did get an offer. I just got an offer. Um, and Andrew says, well, you met your wife on that, sh on that, uh, set, right? <laughs> no, he didn't meet her, but he did talk to her. He, he like, they got to know each other. So yeah. Rob, Mick, I'll trade you the Graboid painting to see that movie. I might do that. <laughs> that's the only, I love that Graboid painting. Uh, that Rob, that may happen. Um, <laughs> that's that's the only way. I mean, he would have to sit with me, never touch the copy, <laughs> not go to his house, to pipe it in, like stream it from from a secure location. He would, yeah, you'd have to sit with me and watch this, and that's it. Like, and then yeah, after, yeah he has to. You have to confiscate his phone. <laughs> no digital recording. No digital. <laughs> no bootlegs. <laughs> Dave Chappelle that the whole way through. Uh, not because it's going to be good, because it's going to be bad. Um, Len Francis says, should bring Mel on the show. It would be cool to hear behind the scenes. Yeah, story. I was going to say. I am. I have a, I've, I've got a few people lined up for interviews. I have to set up times to do it. And Mel is um, tough because, like, when you, when you do the stream, is around when it's bedtime. But, but I can take yeah. care of all of that. Well, no, I would do, I can do an interview, 
uh, session with her and we can just record it at a time that works. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's true. Um, so that, that wouldn't be a big deal. Cause that would be, that would be a good one for podcasts where I can just talk to her and, and, and ask questions and get stories. Oh. Um, so, uh, Rob says, Mick, the three foot by four foot graboid for both the movie and the behind the scenes feature. I don't know about that, Rob. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, sorry. I, you can't, you went, you've overextended. Uh, Cause I'm very, very pretentious in that feature <laughs> to a point where it was like brand new film student pretentious uh, because this is before I got kicked out. That was, was it? I think so. No, no, because Mel Mel joined in the second month. That's right. You know, you are right. You're right. I'm yeah. sorry. Um, and then uh, yeah, so that's oh my god, that is so. Thanks, Andrew, for bringing that up. <laughs> so By the way, hi, Andrew. I I'm I'm sorry. I didn't. I'm not reading the, the comments or anything. And we worked on a, we worked on plenty of. Uh oh, we're there. We worked. I, I thought you froze for a second. We worked on plenty of bad ones during the course of school. Um, I love your laugh for it too. You just know. Uh, now, I, and listen. I know the three bro show fair is the one or the ones that are probably. We didn't even get a crew back for our second movie. That's how bad the first movie was. The crew, the crew was like, I think I'll sit this one out. But I will say this: people trusted me as a producer. Once I left Three Bro Show, people were like, all right, we'll come to you. <laughs> we'll talk to you. Uh, the other guys do, are doing well, too, I'm sure. Uh, I don't know. I think you talk to Alex, don't you? Mel still talks to Alex. I, I mean, I see him on Facebook, and I just I don't use Facebook, really. Oh, Len Francis. Was Zombie, Zombie, Zombies part of this? No, that was, a, that was uh, directed by some of our teachers. Well, not directed by, but it was um, that worked on by some of our teachers. And I got a job doing lighting on it. Um, and then I became an extra as a zombie. I was the tallest zombie in the hallway. Um, <laughs> and then I, I got I got picked as the feature zombie to bite the dude's arm, the hero's arm, um, and be the first to blow up. But I had to go take a final. So I bit his arm, and I actually bit. I told him, I was like, do you really want me to bite this? And they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> he was pissed that I put his arm, uh, and then I got replaced because I couldn't do cover shots. <laughs> so that was uh, zombie, zombie, zombies with with Johnny Backhand Vegas. That was a real character. He was a pimp who had a uh, <coughs> strong backhand, and he <laughs> backhand those zombies. Um, it was pretty pretty horrible. Um, so I think we've talked about film school enough. <laughs> we can move on from that so I want to talk uh, we lost a very prolific in my opinion director a lot of people may not agree but I I, I would say Joel Schumacher mm-hmm. was definitely um, definitely a name that either you either loved or you hated or you did both I love his movies it doesn't bat nipples don't even bother me that much um, yeah <laughs> After Batman versus Superman and Justice League, bat nipples are fine. Uh, but the he was a director of some fantastic movies. And Joe, I want to talk to you a little bit about like you know some of your favorite Joel Schumacher movies. Um, um, I, it, falling down immediately comes to mind. Um, Great movie. Yeah, that uh, that that's. Uh, you know, not not to get too deep into it, but it was a movie that I kind of liked because I misinterpreted it at first. I, I feel, and I feel like a lot of people misinterpret the movie, and 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 sympathize in the wrong way with the main character, who's not, you know. Um, yeah. But anyway, um, there's also he did uh, he did Flatliners, right? He did Flatliners and. Good. Um, eight millimeter. Uh, eight was, millimeter. Yep. Yeah, uh, that was a that was a movie he did. That, that was that was around like I think a little after Seven came out. So like there was kind of a a, a a surge in kind of the gritty crime movie, you know that that 
had some kind of disturbing themes to it, you know. So and then eight millimeter came out. So and I loved seven. So when eight millimeter came out, I, I had to go see that too. I, that was a, I think a lot of people um, forget the movies that he did. Like, I mean, we all know Lost Boys. Um, oh yes, yeah. He was. Uh, I mean, Saint Elmo's Fire is arguably one of the biggest Brat Pack movies, especially in formulating the Brat Pack altogether. Because um, yes, you had you had Breakfast Club, but Saint Elmo's Fire was kind of like the extended version. Everybody was pretty much in that movie, mm. except for Molly Ringwald. Um, Which I I have not seen that, and I didn't know Joel Schumacher directed it. Yeah, that was his that was his second movie, to, uh, second or third movie. No, he did The Incredible Shrinking Woman, um, and then he did DC Cab, which was the Mr. T movie. Uh, okay. Adam Baldwin, Jane from uh, Firefly, was the star of that movie. Oh, okay. Um, so he did Lost Boys. He did Cousins. Remember the Ted Danson movie where he falls in love with his cousin. No, I don't remember that. One. <laughs> I remember that catching such blowback from people uh, <laughs> because Ted Dan- because it was called Cousins and it was a it was a romance movie about Ted Danson falling in love with his cousin. Um, I'm not the character. I'm I'm literally saying it was Ted Danson falling in love with his cousins. That's how this, that's how deep this goes. Uh, then he did uh, Flatliners and. I uh, did Dying Young, which was a Julia Roberts like movie where she like was dating a boxer and he died. Uh, mm. So he was pretty good. He got he got, uh, it was kind of funny that he went from you had like DC Cab, which is now right comedy, then you go to Saint Elmo Fire, which is the angstiest. I mean, even more than Breakfast Club, in my opinion, is the angstiest um, Brat Club Brat Pack movie. Mm. Um, then to Lost Boys, which is an angsty horror movie that we all just love. Like, he got the angst right. After he got it wrong, like, it was overly angsty. Um, like, all right, I don't care. The movie's, like, 40 years old, so I'm, I'm just going to ruin it for you. As St. Elmo's Fire ends with the me more sitting in her apartment with all the windows open, but there's bars on the windows. It's important to remember. Um, in her apartment, in her underwear, freezing to death in Chicago cold. And all of her friends rush to her aid but can't get in the door. <laughs> and they're like, open the door, open the door, we're just here to help you, we want to help you. <laughs> it's so, and she's so, like, she's crying because she's depressed and shit. Um, and that's how, like, she's choosing to commit suicide. I'm not making a small, um, I'm, not, I'm not trying to demean, demean uh, suicide in any way, shape, or form. But this movie definitely did that by choosing this route to go with it. Um, and then, like, you get Lost Boys and you get Cousins. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you get Flatliners, which is an out-there bonkers movie, which I love. And then you get Dying Young. <laughs> and then to culminate in all of that, Falling Down. <laughs> People haven't seen, you've at least probably seen the Foo Fighters video. Uh, yeah. <laughs> which mimics it. Um it's a, it's definitely an interesting movie. And I, I don't think that's one that, like you said, it's very easy because you want to sympathize with Michael Douglas's character in the movie. And when you walk away from it with different eyes, like when I was younger, it was like, he is the hero. So at the end of the movie, you're kind of like, he's just trying to get to his daughter. I think it was her daughter, his daughter, right? Yeah. He's trying to get to his daughter's birthday party or whatever, but he's causing havoc throughout the entire town. And then it's so you're like sympathizing through him because you feel like you're supposed to. You feel like he's the guy who's supposed to be the hero in this, doing things mm-hmm. that we've all wanted to do. Um, <laughs> he is not the hero as, as you go on. He is very much the villain of the movie. We're just following him more than we are the hero. Robert Duvall's character is the hero of the movie. Um, so it's a very twisted movie, uh, which I don't think in today's world would work. You know, I don't think that they would allow the, I don't think they would allow the audiences to uh, to sympathize with the villain as much. Like sympathize with the villain's fine. Like you can sympathize with Darth Vader. You can sympathize with a lot of villains. I think sympathy is what makes villains so much better. But 
my meaning here is with Michael Douglas in this movie is he doesn't do anything that you really should sympathize for. He just gets mad is really what it comes down to. I mean, you can explain it away with mental illness now in the nineties. They did not do that, but um, what's your take on it? Would you think they could make that movie today? Well, I don't know. I mean, you, you could probably draw comparisons with like the Joker um, that just came out, you know, cause he's, he's not, he's sympathetic, but he does bad stuff, you know, and, and, and I mean, I guess, I don't know. I don't, I, I'd have to think about it more. But, but I think uh, that's a good point with the Joker, but even then, like mm-hmm. take Falling Down and take the Joker, which are very similar movies mm-hmm. in tone, but they pushed the mental illness. And I, again, I'm not, yeah. I'm not saying yeah, they didn't, shouldn't. they didn't say that Joker was just a regular guy who was pushed too far. Yeah. You know? um, he, he did have, he did have his issues, I suppose. I think the, I think like what he went through in the Joker, what he went through with his mother, what he went through um, with, you know, being beat up in, in the streets by peers and things like that. And the end, the mental illness and everything else going on along with it. That whole movie is set to make you sympathize with them. Cause I know people who walked away from that movie and were like, this is a fantastic view of what mental illness is. And, uh, you know, they don't actually think of him as the villain in the movie. Mm-hmm. Whereas where I'm like, well, if he wasn't the villain before, he sure is when he shoots that guy in the head. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not going to, I'm not ruining which person he shoots. And he shoots a lot of people in the head, but, um, <laughs> so take from that what you will. Like you can, you can justify everything up until that point. And then it's like, yeah, I think the thing we need to look at is like, if we let this go and we're not helping the mentally ill, like, which is something yeah. I never heard as, uh, as some, as from anybody, uh, from that movie, I've heard everybody say it's a fantastic view of mental illness, but nobody walked away saying, yeah, it's a fantastic view of mental illness. If we don't do anything to help social workers, or give them more money to help out, mm-hmm. you know, help men, uh, help with mental health. Um, yeah. Which is ironic because I feel like that's what the whole movie was trying to do. Um, mm-hmm. But then going back to like falling down and, uh, and saying that, like nobody, if you go back, I've never heard anybody go back and say, well, he was mentally ill. Like he obviously is, you know, we say push too far, but by the time we jump in, he's like already snapped. You know, so it's yeah because it wasn't any, he hadn't been going to work for months, but it wasn't didn't tell anybody. Yeah, even like pretending to go to work and like getting stuck in traffic, I guess, <laughs> just for no good reason. And uh, yeah, so he he sort of he he was kind of he was he was a person who sort of the capitalist system was sort of spit him out, you know, and and. Uh, and then he just he kind of blaming everybody around him for all of the problems that he's encountering and and yeah which is Uh, you know topical it's topical too because if you think about it the only person who was sent to deal with them was the cop yeah like there was nobody there for mental illness to be like uh you know it's 1993 that's Mm -hmm. this is a very different time back then Mm -hmm. um and, and the one the one redeeming thing he does is he kills the the Nazi guy. <laughs> he does. He yeah. does do that. Um, which adds added to the sympathy, I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then we get. Um, but this is the, this is what I love about Joel Schumacher, though, is he can make movies like that. Um, and then he can he can do the the client, which was a pretty big movie when it came out, which was John Grisham movie. Um, <laughs> you know, thriller. And then of course he does seal kiss from a rose video. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't know he did because he got the job directing Batman forever. And that was the move. That was the song oh. that was in that. Right. Movie. And, uh, you know, it's, so it's funny to me that it goes on to Batman and he definitely made Gotham his own in that movie. Um, that is a memorable Gotham. <laughs> Uh, and then he directed A Time to Kill, a poignant movie um, about racism in the South. Um, 
And then Batman and Robin and put nipples on Batman and Robin. <laughs> but not Batgirl. I mean, what's happening here? No <laughs> equal opportunity. Um, he is. He has had some great movies. Uh, I think because even in like later in his career, Eight Millimeter, Tigerland, Bad Company, Phone Booth, The Phantom of the Opera, oh, Number Twenty. Booth, that's right. Yeah, that was a great one. Um, mm -hmm. And you don't. I, I think he didn't catch. Uh, he did. Uh, some House of Cards episodes, things like that. Like he did a lot of stuff. So he passed away this week at 80 years old. He had a year-long battle of cancer. It's very sad. Uh, very sad to hear too um, that you know went through that. But you know, we want. I wanted to say, and I know I think Joe, you do too. You feel the same way. Is we lost a great director, and uh, may he rest in peace. You know. Yeah. I wanted, I wanted to show some appreciation for his work. Um, I know we've been going a little bit long. Uh, I am so happy that you were on the show. We got to talk. I think we would have ended earlier if I didn't bring, if uh, somebody didn't bring up second grade to love. <laughs> to talk about that, but um, I had a fantastic time talking to you. Uh, I love when you come on the show. So anytime you yeah. want to come on, man, please do. Yeah, you should start doing it more. You should, man. I'm always up for you coming on the show because uh, we always have good conversations. And I'll tell next time. You do come on a show. Make sure uh, we tell the Alba Barden story because that's still like one of the most touching things in, 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 to ever happen. Uh, and I tell that story all the time. Um, like, do you know what my friend Joe did for me? Uh, <laughs> so we got um, so everybody. Uh, thanks for watching. But just before we go, we have two new shows starting here on the Scene Snobs channel. I don't know why I do it to myself. I'm I'm now doing five live shows during the week and soon to be even more because there's a couple of other shows that I have coming down the pipe. Uh, <laughs> I will. And uh, just so you guys know, I'm looking for guest hosts to jump in on the scene. Snows podcast live every Tuesday at 9 30 PM. Uh, if you want to be a guest host, please jump in. We are also doing, and Joe, you might be interested in this because you're always welcome on it. Uh, I need an Ed McMahon. We're doing a talk show. It's called the scene snob showcase Friday nights starting at, uh, I think it's 9 PM. And it just kind of goes to whenever you can have a drink, you can hang out, uh, jump on. We can talk about, uh, we can promote whatever you want to promote. If you're a musician, you want to come on and sing, come on and sing. If you're an artist, show us your stuff. If you're an actor, come on and talk about your parts, filmmakers, everything. So uh, it's going to be Zoom right now because we're all locked down, but let's just get it going. So we should have a good time with it. Um, Joe, again, like I said, you're always welcome to do that. That starts this Friday at 9 p.m. So if you want to be on the show this week, let me know. Message me. And we can talk about it and we'll set it up. Um, and then next Monday morning, we are starting with uh, the Monday morning review show, which uh, I will come on and I'll review the past week and what's coming up in the next week. And we'll talk about things that happen over the weekend. Um, because I am taking weekends off after five straight five shows. Um, we are kind of shifting gears. The Scene Snobs Podcast Live is going to be its own entity on Tuesday nights, and then we're going to do Scene Snobs interviews. It's going to be its own separate show. Uh, so look before, be sure to look on that. Um, another thing I have to mention is we have Behind the Box Live tomorrow night at 7.30. Join us. We're going to be talking about some fun stuff. Then we're going to be talking, and then Rob paints the movies on Thursday. So much stuff. Uh, you can check out the schedule and info and more on thescenesnobs.com. It's all on there. Um, we're going to have in, uh, articles coming up. So if you want to be a contributing writer, jump in, let me know, message me and I, we'll talk about it. Um, <laughs> I know I got you sitting here waiting for me and I'm sorry about that. There's just so much going on. Uh, make sure you're following us at the scene snobs for all our information, stuff like that. We have a brand new episode of pulling focus, which is mine and Brian Patrick from skyline indie film festivals, filmmaking podcast. Um, and we, we talk about Father's Day movies and things like that this week and uh, some stuff going on in the movie industry. So jump on that. It's up now. You can go to thescenesnobs.com for links. All right. I don't think I have anything else. I don't think there could be anything else that I have on this show um, because that's a mouthful. Uh, it really is. And I'm always doing show prep, and you know what that's like. So uh, thank you, everybody, for chiming in and joining in. Joe, again, thank you for jumping in. Uh, please come back Thanks again. Thanks for having me. And uh, until next time, everybody, take care. I love yous and have a great one.